Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. It's the first one of a new year. The first one of a new decade, 2020. Which sounds very sciencey. 2020 sounds very sci-fi, doesn't it? It sounds way more futuristic than 2019. I mean, I know that's a stupid thing to say because it quite literally is more futuristic than 2019. But I don't know, 2020 just sounds more epic. And it makes you wonder what incredible discoveries and inventions that are still to come in the future. Uh, My name's Dan. Thank you so much for giving us a listen. This week, we are headed to a place that is so quiet, it can drive you insane. Also, we'll learn about a brand new meat substitute that's made of air. And we'll talk about the effect that the devastating Australian bushfires are having on the animals that live there. Uh, Also, I'll answer some of your questions in a bit. Today, they're all about colour and vampire bats. First, let's start the uh, the show with uh, a lesson from the smartest school outside of the solar system as we go right back to the very start of Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Spaceports. Okay, everyone at Deep Space High, I'm ready to transmit my presentation on spaceports. You're going to love it. Transmitting in three, two, one. Have you ever imagined being an astronaut, experiencing weightlessness as you orbit the Earth, maybe visiting a neighbouring planet? Now, obviously, we're pretty lucky because we get to go to Deep Space High. But check this out. In the near future, everyone on Earth might have a chance to go into space and fly in the same way as they travel by air from airports. All thanks to spaceports. Just imagine a holiday on Jupiter, a trip to the moon and back, or maybe just a short flight to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. These all sound like really cool things to do, right? Well, there are a lot of people who would agree with you about that. Even though there are over 7 billion people on Earth, only around 550 men and women have ever gone into space. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For decades, space exploration has been run by governments, so members of the public like you and me haven't really had a look in. But things are set to change. You might have seen on the news that there are commercial companies developing technology to offer suborbital flights for ordinary people. Well, ordinary rich people at the moment. One is a company called Virgin Galactic, which is owned by a guy called Richard Branson. Another is SpaceX, It's owned by someone called Elon Musk. You might have heard of him. He is also behind the Tesla electric cars. In fact, there's a whole bunch of companies working on ways to get people into space. Commercial space launches are already taking place all the time across Earth, but most don't involve people at all. Some will be carrying astronauts and supplies to the International Space Station. Others are taking satellites into orbit around Earth. Satellites are very important to everyday life on Earth. They deliver TV programs and send us coordinates for our sat-navs. They also undertake scientific experiments, like monitoring the Earth's atmosphere. Now, one big problem facing any launch, whether for people, supplies or satellites, is that you need a lot of power to get out of the Earth's gravitational pull. And you can't launch from anywhere. You need special spaceports. At the moment, there aren't any spaceports in my home country, the UK, and you have to go to America and Russia or further afield to Australia and Brazil to hitch a ride. That can take a long time and cost a lot of money. It would be much simpler and cheaper if space companies could send up their spacecraft closer to where they're built. And this is where things are changing. The British government wants the UK to be the first country in Europe from which commercial flights can be launched. Now, what spaceports look like and where they'll be are questions which haven't been answered yet, but I'll be giving you the lowdown on it all in my amazing presentations on Spaceports UK. Uh Uh-oh, losing the connection. Catch you next time. Deep Space High. Spaceports. Support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. Hello to Sarah Izziet uh, from America, uh, who said some very nice things and said hello over on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, if you've got some nice things that you want to say about the show, that's the best thing you can do, by the way. Leave it as a review uh, over on the Apple Podcast Store. And if you've got a question, something sciencey that you want answered, 
that's what you need to do as well. You need to leave it over there as a review. Uh, that is what Julia, who is 10, from Ireland has done. And she wants to know uh, why things have different colours. Well, Julia, it's all to do with light. Light is made by waves. And all of the waves have different wave lengths. And the different lengths all make up different colours. Interestingly, white light, bright white light that you see, is is all the different lengths in one. It's all the different colours combined. They make white. And some objects have different colours because they absorb some of those wavelengths and they reflect some others. So, uh, for instance, a red jumper is red because the molecules in the dye that make up the jumper absorb all the blue and the violet wavelengths, all that light, and they reflect the red ones back out which make it look red. Uh, And this is used uh, in the wild by creatures to attract a mate or to hide from a predator. They can use their skin uh, to absorb and reflect different wavelengths to help them blend in and appear a different colour. Now Lula, who is eight, wants to know why vampire bats drink blood. Uh, They're the only blood-drinking mammals in the world. And vampire bats drink blood, I mean, pretty simply, because it's how they uh, have evolved. Uh, Evolution is all about survival of the fittest. You need to do what you can to stay alive. Other animals weren't drinking the blood. Uh, The fact that they can has allowed them to survive and quite often thrive in the world. So that's why they do it. But how they do it is actually pretty incredible. Uh, They have special bacteria in their gut that helps them survive on the blood. Because it's actually quite hard to digest and break down for, uh, for a normal creature. How they get the blood is pretty fascinating. They gallop around the ground on all fours. They leap onto a victim, slicing into their veins with razor-sharp teeth. They've even got special nerves in their face that help them sense the heat in prey's veins so they can be more efficient and get the most blood from the hottest part Uh, they've also got an enzyme in their saliva which stops the blood from clotting so they can carry on drinking it i mean when you cut yourself uh the blood will congeal won't it at the top it will clot so you don't carry on bleeding forever in the saliva of a vampire bat they've got something that stops that happening so they can carry on drinking and drinking and drinking now blood is hard from the kidneys to turn into healthy stuff so the gut bacteria helps them out with that it's kind of a deal that they make the bacteria has a warm place to live and to stay and to survive and in return it helps the vampire bats eat So thank you so much. It's quite an amazing answer to a fascinating question, Lula. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on the Apple Podcast Store. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, over, over the break, you must have seen the news has quite rightly been dominated by the wildfires that are sweeping across Australia. Uh, since September, they've destroyed more than 10.3 million hectares. Just untold destruction everywhere. Uh, and reports are now saying that half a billion animals have been killed in the blaze. So I want to find out more uh, with this with Colin Beale, who's an ecologist from the University of York. Hey, Colin. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you've had experience looking at the effects of wildfires across the world. Um, how do these things tend to start? Well, most fires uh, in across the world in drylands have actually started by people, either deliberately or accidentally Uh, and then if it's really hot and dry conditions those fires can spread completely out of control. Uh, I I think the the, the same is uh, more or less what's happening in Australia at the moment whether these are deliberate or or accidental we're we're not quite sure. Once they start then sparks from one fire uh, can be transported in the wind to start other fires elsewhere uh, very easily and very quickly. Now the most recent estimate is well, at the time I'm recording this, is uh, 480 million animals have been affected by the fires. How would how will these creatures have been affected in your experience? Uh, so those those estimates are based mainly on uh, the vertebrates, on um, mammals, birds, and reptiles, uh, and they're based on the area that has burned. So as ecologists, we have methods for counting um, the different types of birds or different uh, reptiles. And mammals, we use those techniques to um, count how many animals there are in an area. And then, if we know how many, uh, how large an area has burnt, we can assess how many animals have been affected by those fires um, 
as a simple multiplication of the area by the, the density of animals in each of those areas. Before we talk about what might have happened to the animals that are there, I want to know more about these techniques, Colin. Uh, you said that you have some methods for estimating how many animals there are in a certain space. What, what are those methods? Is it just as simple as you sat there with a notepad ticking off everyone you see? Uh, well, it's really hard to do that. So some things uh, are um, what we call comprehensively counted. So if you want to count reptiles, actually the very best way to count reptiles uh, in Australia, because most of them are actually in the top of the soil, is, what, is a, an effectively a destructive sampling. You decide, OK, we're going to assess this little area in front of us, maybe 10 metres by 10 metres, and you've got a team of people and you're going to trim all the leaves, the lower leaves off the bushes and look for anything in there. And then you're going to hoover all of the, the leaf litter uh, and look for anything, sift through that really carefully. And then you're actually going to dig the top little bit of soil out of the way and find as many animals living in that soil as possible. It's a really hard job to do that sort of thing. Um, and uh, uh, the different methods are used for different things. So that's how you might count reptiles. But if you want to count birds... Um, uh, we, we usually use transects, so we might walk a set distance. We might walk, say, one kilometre through a woodland and record how many birds we see uh, at different distances to the path that we take on either side and use that to assess both how many uh, animals we see and try and guess how many we're not seeing as well. Uh, and then we can use that to estimate the density of those things. I want to use your experience as an ecologist to try and figure out maybe some of the effects of, of the fires in the animals there. I, I guess very simplistically, their homes have been destroyed. But if, if we were to unpack it a little bit deeper, uh, how else do these fires affect the creatures that live there? Uh, so that's absolutely right. The, the first thing that happens when a fire goes through, usually most of the animals can detect the smoke, particularly in these areas where, where fires happen fairly regularly anyway. Animals are used to, to that. Uh, and they um, will either run away or fly away or hide if they can. Um, and most of them probably survive the initial fire itself. Some of them definitely uh, will unfortunately be killed by the heat itself. Uh, the other ones, then their, their homes are destroyed, but actually um, they, there's rapidly a lot of life returning to these areas. So if they've survived uh, in situ, if they survived in the areas there, then, then they'll get up and once the fire's gone through, and they'll try and find somewhere nearby that still has what they need. So initially after a fire, there, there might be a whole load of cooked insects uh, that have been caught up in, in the flames. Uh, and if you're a, an insect-eating bird, that's a great thing. You'll be very happy to have um, a roasted grasshopper for breakfast. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can keep going for a few weeks like that. Uh, and then uh, other animals come in from outside. So a lot of the animals that have escaped out of the, the fire zone will start coming back um, uh, and exploring the landscape, trying to find new homes in there as well. Um, and things tend to have difficulty to begin with. There's not much shelter from the sun. Uh, there may be holes in trees. If you live in a hole in a tree or, or underground, then you'll be okay, and you'll find a, a physical shelter. Um, but if you're, if you're not able to use those, then these, these areas are pretty hostile, and you'll probably move out and into the neighboring areas until um, the next rains occur, uh, whenever they may, may be. And uh, Australia is currently going through a really serious drought. It's very dry there. It hasn't rained uh, in a lot of these areas for a long time, not, not properly. Uh, but when that rain does eventually return, those woodlands will sprout green again pretty quickly. The grass will come back, um, and many of the bushes and trees themselves will be able to regrow uh, one way or another. Uh, and the, the animals and plant, uh, the animals will return to those as soon as it's nice and green again, um, assuming that those rains come as we, we hope they will do um, at the end of the summer. You say that they are in the middle of this, this, this terrible drought, and it's been going on for months now. If you're an animal, how long can you wait before you do go out there into the wild when it does rain? You, you know, if it's not rained in four months, say, 
how able are animals to withstand that? Well, this is also very variable depending on what sort of an animal you are. If you are um, uh, an invertebrate, uh, uh, such as um, uh, a grasshopper or a beetle or something, uh, or even uh, butterflies and things, they, they have a, what we call um, estivation, which is it's like a summer hibernation. They, will, they can shut themselves down uh, and do very, very little and burn very little energy throughout that hot, dry, inhospitable period. And then when it cools off, when it gets wet and green again, then essentially they, they recover um, as if they had been hibernating. Um, that's not possible for birds, uh, and birds... Uh, and, and most mammals don't do that in, in the heat. Um, so they will potentially, they'll struggle to find water. That's the, the key thing that they need. Um, but if they've been in a landscape where there has been water before, even after the fire, there will still be some water that they can drink. Um, so they should be okay um, until those water sources themselves dry up. Um, but it, they, they will need shade and shelter because um, one of the best ways the birds uh, and animals shelter themselves from extreme heat is, is by sitting under a tree or in a tree hole or something during the hottest part of the day. Uh, and if those trees have lost all of their leaves, it's much more exposed. They're going to be um, using up their water faster. So, so that's, that's a concern. And without water, birds will, um, many birds can't live more than a few days. And you mentioned that the, the harvest time for some birds at, at this point, when there are, you know, may, maybe quite a few burnt insects on the ground. Mm. What what about other animals in the long term? I mean, if there has been millions and millions of creatures that have died, how much will that affect the food chain of perhaps some of the bigger mammals when they are trying to eat in the next year? So this is something we we don't really know uh, in, in in a lot of detail. Uh, probably the herbivores will be fine. So things that eat grasses and bushes, um, if they've survived the fire and they've left the area, um, they've found somewhere uh, to, to live nearby until the rain arrives, then they'll move back in as soon as the, the rain comes and they'll go back to their homes and they'll be fine. Um, the, the, anim- the mammals that are most hard hit uh, in previous fires are, uh, in Australia in particular, are the small carnivorous uh, marsupials. Um, and those ones, uh, they, they probably do very well, just like the, the birds do for the first few days when there's, there's cooked insects to eat. But then um, the small mammals that they're looking for uh, have moved away. Um, and predators tend to be more territorial, more tied to their uh, home areas than herbivores do. And herbivores will often move a long way, whereas the, the predators don't, and then the predators starve. So previously, when big fires have gone through Australian bushlands, it's those small carnivorous mammals that have suffered uh, the longest-term damage to their populations. I'm glad that we were able to uh, to talk about this stuff. No one, you never really think about you know the effects that it has uh, for all of ecology, do you? Anyway, Colin Beale, thank you so much for joining us on the Science Weekly. You're welcome. Thank you. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're headed to a place that is so quiet, it can send you mad. Orfield Laboratories in the US, it's created one of the quietest places on Earth. It's an anechoic chamber, so there's no echo in the room. It's covered in foam and nets, it's surrounded by double walls of steel and concrete, and they help it absorb 99.9% of the sound inside. Now, it's used to test volumes and sound quality of things that companies uh, are getting ready to sell, Uh, but it can also drive people crazy. You see, imagine the noise in your bedroom when you think it's a quiet night. It probably measures at around 30 decibels. Loads of the sounds that you don't really notice happen, but they're there but you still think it's quiet. That's 30 decibels. The sound levels in this anechoic chamber is minus nine decibels. Minus nine! That's 39 decibels lower than something you think is quiet. It's so silent that you can hear your own organs. You can hear the beating of your heart, the gurgling of your stomach. You can even hear your own ears, which turn out make a tiny bit of noise. Now, this sound 
can make you turn on yourself. The longest time that anyone has managed to stand it is 45 minutes. When you take away the noise, your awareness becomes messed up. You have to sit down. Your perception of where things are becomes skewed. Balance and movement, a balance, sorry, and movement, they become impossible. Imagine trying to walk, but you can't hear the footsteps. It changes the way you kind of think about the world. You lose sense of what is actually happening. And this lack of noise can drive you insane. Now, I'm fairly sure that ways that we can save the world and and help our climate uh, is going to carry on being a massive focus for everyone in in 2020. So I thought we'd get a little head start uh, on what we can do and have a listen to one of our favourite gadget gurus, Techno Mum, who's here to tell us all about recycling. Techno Mum's Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Welcome back to Tech Trivia, the game show that tests the technical talents of our tremendous contestants. And playing this week, it's Techno Mom! Hi! Now you've been smashing our scoreboard so far, but the game's not over yet. Let's get going and spin the wheel! And today's category is Recycling. Your time starts now. Your first question, why is recycling important in technology? Well, recycling is important for everyone. There's only a certain amount of resources on our planet, and with many of them, once they're gone, they're gone. Now, most designers want their things to make to be available not just today, but tomorrow, next week, and even next year. That's called being sustainable. But if you want your stuff to be sustainable, you need to think carefully as you design your new product and before choosing the raw material. Sometimes reusing something can be cheaper than using something new. You've probably got a refillable water bottle for school. That's certainly cheaper than buying a new bottle every day. Well, these days, designers will design what they make so parts can easily be reused. Did you know that around 90% of a modern car can be recycled? Metals can be used to build a new car, whilst old tyres can go into road surfacing. And if you think about it, design is not just about reusing materials. Part of what engineers do every day is recycle ideas, reusing the very best ideas, improving them to come up with brilliant new solutions to problems. Well, you're improving your score, right? Next question. Name a cool way recycling has solved an engineering problem. Oh gosh, there's loads. Well, a bit like glass bottles, plastic bottles can also be recycled and made into clothing. The plastic is shredded, melted and spun into polyester. That's a type of thread. And milk cartons can be recycled as well, into other plastic things like fence posts. In fact, new plastic can be made from all sorts of substances. There's even a type of plastic which is made from pig weed. Ah, gross. But hey, that is pretty cool. Last question, and you're going to have to be quick. Can you give me a job where you'd need to use recycling? Mm, I'm going to say aerospace engineering. That's like being a rocket scientist. In some places, recycling is the only way to get things done. For example, space. If you were travelling to Mars, you can't get supplies along the way. But supplies are heavy and they can slow you down. So the more you can recycle, the further you can go. Aerospace engineers are expert at figuring out ways to reuse things that are likely to run out like water to drink and oxygen to breathe. I have to stop you there. The results are through. And you're through to the next round, Techno Mum. Great. That means you won't need to get a new contestant in. Recycling in action. Techno Mum Tech Trivia with the Institution of Engineering Technology. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash techtrivia. We've had a few weeks off from the show, so I thought it would be best to have a look at all the science that you might have missed in the news. The first core stage for NASA's mega rocket, the Space Launch System, it's left its factory in New Orleans in America, and it's uh, go- about to go through some crucial tests. The SLS is a critical part of NASA's Artemis program. It hopes to get Americans back to the moon by 2024, and it's now undergoing comprehensive tests to make sure that it's ready for launch. Also, Finnish scientists producing a new protein from thin air say that it will compete with soya within a decade. Soya is a meat substitute, it's used by both humans and animals, but this new protein is made from soil bacteria fed on hydrogen that has been split by water. And apparently it tastes of nothing, which is good because it can be used to grow stuff that is flavoured. It's more multi-purpose than meat and it's better for the environment. And finally, things that uh, that we're using instead of plastic packaging could actually be harming the environment, a UK parliamentary report has said. 
Companies swapping to other materials could be worse for the planet. You see, glass bottles are heavier than plastic, so are more polluting to transport. Paper bags tend to have higher carbon emissions as well than plastic ones, and they're harder to reuse. Loads to think about for this year in saving the planet. And that is it for this week on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for giving us a listen. Uh, Over Christmas and through the new year, if you did get any new gadgets, make sure that you do subscribe to us on them. If you've got a new phone, a new tablet, maybe you've got a new smart speaker. Remember, you can always wake up with the magic word, then ask it to pay the Fun Kids Science Weekly and we'll get you sorted. If you listen to us over on the Apple Podcast Store, that's one of the best ways that you can leave uh, a question for the show. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered, uh, you need to find the Fun Kids Science Weekly on there leave it as a review also you can get in touch by sending me a message over at funkidslive.com you can find loads more of our amazing science uh, stuff that we do loads of things that you've heard today we've got tons more they're all on the website they're on the fun kids app uh, and they're on all the places that you find your podcasts as well and fun kids we're a children's radio station from the uk you can hear us all over the country on your dab digital radio on the free fun kids app and as always at funkidslive.com <laughs>